right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm actually delighted to be joined by someone else who is from San Diego, who's literally up the road, Parker Stevenson from Evolved Finance. How are you doing, Parker? John, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, um, and Parker is, the, is a partner and the chief business officer um, of, uh, of Evolved Finance. And what we want to talk about today are some of the mistakes that business owners of online businesses make with their finances. And I think this will resonate with a lot of people because anybody who's run an online business knows that there's, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of pitfalls and unforeseen things. It all seems so simple when you think I can have an online business, everything's going to be easy. I've got all these cloud services. It's fantastic. And I'm just going to be able to sell loads and make loads of money. And it turns out that eh, it's not always as straightforward and simple as that. Have you um, been talking so with their clients, John? <laughs> <laughs> No, because somebody actually the other day was asking about something. It was a drop shipping and they, and they were like, oh, look, and you can do this and you can do that. And then I said, um, your, your supplier, the, the, said, do they take returns? Oh, I don't know. Let me check. No, they don't. I said, well, guess where the returns are going? <laughs> going <laughs> that said, sounds what? like a nightmare. Yeah. He said, what do you mean? I said, they'll have to go back to you and then you'll have to decide whether you want to keep them. Reset. And he said, oh, this doesn't sound that simple. And I said, yeah, there you go. So anyway, yeah. Uh, Anyway, Parker, so um, when you're working with your clients, what, what are some of the mistakes that they made? Maybe the surprising, unforeseen issues that come up? Well, I, I don't know um, about your audience, John, but um, so many of our clients, at least, like a lot of them didn't maybe realize they were going to start businesses. Like that's right. the thing about the online space is that it's opened up the doors and kind of lowered the barriers for people that maybe didn't think of themselves as businessy or as entrepreneurs to get businesses going almost by accident. Um, you know, we have our fair share of hardcore entrepreneurs that they live and breathe this stuff. But I, I think so many of the online businesses we've worked with, they don't, they only know what they're good at and they only know like maybe even just the sales and marketing part of their business. So I think one of the first mistakes we see is just not paying attention to your numbers at all. Like, so I, I can't tell you how many people have come to us because we, we provide a bookkeeping service specifically for online businesses. And we'll yeah. have some clients come to us who are doing high six figures, low seven figures, and have no idea what the, where they're at with their finances because it's just no one's told them. They weren't really sure how it worked. They weren't aware of what they needed to do. All they know is that they, they're going to have to owe taxes and hopefully their account, accountant will just figure it out. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and that's always great when you, when you um, outsource to fate, if you like, and hopefully all this <laughs> stuff will will take care of itself. Um, yeah, and I think that's true because I mean, obviously the barrier to entry uh, has been lowered, uh, especially for an online business and you can have all of these SaaS services and you can, you know, you can, you can get your website up, you can have a, a, an automated answering service. So it looks like you can have a, an address, you can have a phone, you can have all of these things and it's all very, and they all seem like they don't cost that much money. And so you can add all these services and then suddenly, um, you realize that uh, you're underwater. Well, yeah, and especially with um, you know our clients' businesses, the big the big expenses we're we're looking at because so many of our clients sell courses, they have membership mm -hmm. sites, they have yeah. coaching programs, or consultants, or authors, or bloggers. Um, that um, again, they just they just might look at their merchant account and go, "I got money, money's coming yeah. in." but they don't really know what's going out. And especially for our, the types of businesses we serve, a lot of them aren't really sellable, right? They're not businesses mm -hmm. that they're ever going to be able to sell and have a big payday. So it's like being profitable as soon as you can is really important because that's how you're going to make your money. That's how you're going to build your wealth. So if you're not paying attention to how your expenses are creeping up with your revenue, then what's the point if we're not, you know, making at least a good chunk of profit at the end of the year to, to be able to pay yourself from. So that's kind of a, a piece that again, if you're not, super familiar with business and you kind of fell into it, like just getting some sort of system for tracking your numbers. Cause it's going to make it easier for your accountant. It's going to make it easier for you to analyze the business, make sure it's healthy. But then speaking of accountants, and again, we're not accountants. We don't file mm -hmm. taxes for our clients, but the biggest nightmares we've seen for entrepreneurs is when they don't get an accountant involved in their business fast yeah. enough. And it's like, 
most of us aren't starting businesses because we're excited to work with accountants. Like it's just a necessary <laughs> evil of running yeah. your own business. But at the end of the day, it's like the nightmare scenarios we've seen is when someone's uncle filed their taxes for them or they had um, their spouse just do it on TurboTax or some just way that, again, I've just seen too many nightmare stories to ever even imagine doing that myself. But a situation where you don't know any better, you're trying to save some money, make mm -hmm. it seem simpler, less intimidating. But if you trust the wrong person to deal with your taxes, hey, it is not yeah. very fun. Yeah, and and some of those initial mistakes that people make, like commingling, commingling funds, mm -hmm. like mixing, using personal account and business account, and and mixing all of that up, and that's exactly what uh, you know, an, a good accountant, a good financial advisor is going to immediately tell you not to do those kind of things, that can cause you a lot of trouble later on. Yeah. And you actually brought up one of the other things I was going to mention is commingling accounts. Again, mm -hmm. it's like, if no one tells you, you don't really know that it's not the way to do things, but, um, you know, separating your business and personal finances, um, for some people, I think it's just like, well, no, duh, that just seems to make sense. Yeah. And for some people it's like, I don't know, I'm just selling all this stuff. Like no one told me I, I should be doing this. So, and that's fine. Like, again, I think it's great that the barrier to entry to starting a business has been mm -hmm. lowered and people are doing amazing things as entrepreneurs running all these new types of businesses. But at the end of the day, it's like there's this extra responsibility you have as an entrepreneur that sometimes people don't really internalize. They don't really understand like, oh, I'm not just gonna get a paycheck and then, yeah. I just do it in TurboTax and it's done. It's like, no, I have to now manage the finances for my business and I have to make sure my personal finances are in order. So there's this extra responsibility that comes with it. So again, keeping your finances separate, getting that accountant on board, actually paying attention to your numbers, hiring a bookkeeper or doing it internally to make sure that you have some sort of feedback. Like these are the things that like the rules to the game that unless someone teaches you, <laughs> how are you supposed to know that's what you're supposed to do? Yeah, and and I think, uh, and especially as you said, I mean, a lot of your clients are, are your consultants, or coaches, or trainers, or people like this, you know, and and I do think one of one of the challenges is I know I've done um, business consulting myself in the past. So one of the biggest challenges you have then is you got a you got a prospect for business, and then when you got business, you got to deliver that business, but you also still got a prospect for more business, and otherwise you end up with those peaks and valleys where you mm -hmm. have you know, you have, you're doing loads of work, but you're not building any pipeline. Then you're building pipeline because um, your work is over, so you have no money coming in. So you have to, you have to somehow find a way of, of organizing yourself and, and realizing that, the, that that is going to be an ongoing friction in the business. Well, yeah, and I think what surprises a lot of people, because again, I, I think the internet, it naturally tracks sales and marketing people because mm -hmm. it's like, ooh, all my customers are just, waiting there for me on Facebook or on Instagram, yeah. or they're waiting for, for, uh, for me in my email list. So we see so many people focus on sales and marketing to begin with, which is every yeah. business needs that to function like that. I kind of sure. look at it as we're playing two games. So everyone wants to play game number one, which is how do I find my customers and convert them? Or how do I find my leads and convert them into customers? Yeah. Our, cl our biggest clients are phenomenally good at that. And, and as they should be, but as your business grows, all of a sudden the second game comes into play game number two, which is, can you manage your cash flow as your revenue is increasing? Because when you're just trying to make money so you can cover your expenses every month, that's all you're thinking about. But all of a sudden you start to have some success. Your revenue gets more consistent. Maybe you had the biggest launch you've ever had. Maybe your, your uh, cold traffic funnel is starting to do better than, um, than it's ever done in the past. And we have more money coming through your business. Then all of a sudden it's like, well, what do I do with this? Cause now mm -hmm. it's like, you know, you want to invest back into your business. You know, you want to help the revenue grow. You know, you want to stabilize it. But if we're not, understanding the relationship between our expenses and our revenue and paying attention to that relationship, then again, you might have increasing revenue. Your expenses are going up at the exact same rate. And then again, if we're not building businesses, we can sell. What's the point? Yeah. And, and the cash flow issue is obviously the big one. And I think that's one that often catches a lot of people by surprise because, and, and, and I think this often affects small businesses unfairly in a way. Sometimes it doesn't affect big businesses because if you do, if you're a small business or you're a solopreneur or whatever, and you sell a service to a larger company, you know, sometimes they're not going to pay you in 30 days. Sometimes mm -hmm. they will pay you in 60 days or they'll pay you in 90 days, depending on how they're feeling, knowing right well that you're never going to sue them for that money or whatever, because exactly. you can't afford 
but I think that's where a lot of people get caught. Suddenly they think, well, I've sold this amount of, of, of business. I'm doing great. But they don't allow for that, you know, buffer for the fact that that money may not come into your account in a timely manner. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, if, if you're doing a Silicon Valley startup and you get some money, maybe you, you have some other people in your team sure. right off the bat, right? And you can have someone who's going to handle the finances. You have someone who's doing the coding or the technology mm -hmm. and all these pieces. Almost every single one of our clients started off just with them. And so yeah. when you're wearing all the hats, again, you're going to have blind spots. There's going to be parts of your business you're just not aware of that you need to be paying attention to that. That's where, again, I think we see so many of, uh, especially the types of clients we serve, get shocked when they're like, oh, making money isn't the only thing I have to worry about. What I mm -hmm. do with the money now all of a sudden becomes something that's more important. And it's not complicated. Like what I think a lot of people overcomplicate finance. They think it's going to be more difficult than, than, it, than it really is. Um, the reality is the difficult part is doing the bookkeeping, like what we do, yeah. right? It's just yeah. organizing the data properly, reconciling it properly. If you have no idea what reconciling means, that's fine. Ultimately, just making sure that what's in your bookkeeping software is exactly the same as what's going on in your checking account, the credit cards, your merchant yeah. accounts, all that. That's the hard part. That takes some skill. It takes some knowledge. It takes some training. <laughs> but if you have someone on your team doing that, then looking at the numbers isn't that hard. And, and that's what I think a lot of our clients realize. They go, oh, why did I think this was going to be so difficult? Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's not. Someone just need to organize it for you. But then that's where we start to see a lot of our clients feel really empowered. They start to feel like, oh, I can do this. Like I can understand this part of my business. And if you can understand the financial side of your business, like those are the people that really, I think their businesses just naturally take off because they feel empowered to make those hard decisions around when do I invest in my business? Um, how much money do I need to keep saved for cash flow? Like some of these things that, again, mm -hmm. if you're a marketer and salesperson, maybe you never had to think about before, but if you feel empowered around those things, you can take on the world. I mean, world yeah, your oyster. No, absolutely. I, I totally agree. And I think it's a good thing. Obviously, if you don't know what reconciling is, that's probably a good, good sign that you need a bookkeeper immediately. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but uh, what I was going to say was, I think I think the other thing that and and this is a, it's a natural tendency obviously when you're starting on your own and you're trying to save as you're trying to save as much money as possible doing as many things yourself but if you if you discover that there are parts of this like you just said like organizing the financial side like making sure you have all the correct invoices everything all of that kind of stuff if that's not something that either you're good at you want to be good at or you think it's going to suck up too much of your time, I think that's when you have to look and say, okay, I need to make an immediate investment here because it will free me up to build my business. I couldn't agree more. I mean, at the end of the day, there's only so much time. We only, you know, small businesses, even our clients that are doing multi seven figures, it's still a small business, right? Like mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things, it, it, it's really small. So there's only so much time. You only have so much money, so many resources that if you're doing things in your business that aren't revenue generating activities as the business owner, yeah. you probably shouldn't be doing them. Obviously we need to make sure you're clear on the things you can be doing to generate yeah. revenue and you're not wasting your time doing other things, but especially in those early stages where you're starting to get some momentum, you're starting to get more customers and more clients than maybe you've ever had before. There, there comes this point where you do have to make some sort of investment in people to take over the things in your business that um, even if you are good at them, aren't going to be the best use of your time and aren't going to yeah. be the, the, the best way to move the business forward. Yeah. And I'm sure you, you see this all the time with, with clients and, the, and that is where, you know, previously before they engage with somebody like you, they are probably hemorrhaging a little bit of money here and there just because they're, they not, they don't have their finger on the pulse of everything. Like, you know, as we said earlier, maybe there's an expense that was paid out of a personal account, or maybe there was something over here and they forgot to transfer. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of little things that can really hurt as a small business. And it's almost like death by a thousand cuts. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, there, there, it feels very nebulous when you're just looking at your checking account and you're not really mm -hmm. sure what types of expenses are eating up all, all the profit, right? And so what our clients quickly realize is that, especially for online businesses, usually if the business isn't as profitable as it wants to be, it's team or it's advertising or a little yeah. bit of both, right? Mm -hmm. And so once they see the areas that maybe they need to tighten up or work on, their action becomes so much, so much more focused, right? And now they're, they're making informed decisions and they can s turn things around at a snap of their fingers. They really, it's just, do you have the right kind of information? Just like, you know, with 
your marketing, right? Like so much of marketing has become analytics and data and information that um, the best market in the world, marketers in the world are probably better at math than a lot of people would think because they're doing a lot of calculations mm -hmm. around conversion rates and cost per click and, and all this other kind of stuff. So the same thing goes for your finances. Again, it's not hard to understand that data. Just like if you're working with like a great marketing agency and they have really good data to put in front of you, it's just organizing that data is the hard part. So it's just important that we have someone, whether it's someone inside your team, outside of the team, making sure you're looking at the right information in your business to make the best decisions from. Yeah, no, no, a hundred percent. And I think one of the other things that is, is, um, is, as you alluded to earlier, you know, when somebody does start their business, you know, they, they, you know, they'll do some, they'll do some Excel spreadsheet exercise or whatever. Maybe they'll look at their network and they'll say, okay, I can already identify like 10 people from this network who are going to need my services and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But the reality is when you start into it, you're saying, yes, those 10 people might need your services, but maybe not now. Maybe the timing's not right. All of this, everything takes a little bit longer than you would like and things don't fall into place quite as neatly. So you have to kind of factor that into the equation as well. And I think that's sometimes where people get into trouble because they, they do these Excel spreadsheet exercises and they, you know, put in and they calculate and they say, okay, you know, by, by month four, I'm going to be wildly profitable. And you think, well, no, it's probably going to be month 12. <laughs> It's almost like you've done this before, John. You're not speaking from experience, are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, it is, it, it is it's from experience, uh, absolutely, is that everything takes longer and that if you don't, if you, I mean, this is one advice for, you know, just for small business or whatever is you got to have the wherewithal to sustain yourself for longer than you think you're going to need to. Totally agree. And, and I, I never want to be the party pooper because yeah. um, so many, especially having conversations with their clients, these are people with the personalities of like, let's go, let's get stuff yeah. done. Uh, no excuses. We're going to make stuff happen. And I love it. I love that. But um, I think maybe just based on my, a little bit of my personality type, and even as a person who I've taken risks as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and I've taken risks in my life, but it's planned, calculated risks, yeah. right? And so that's where um, it is important to go as much as you have these lofty goal, goals and they look good on paper, what does a more of a worst case scenario look like? Yeah. Like you said, what, let's, let's assume this is going to take longer than we think. And so how can we sustain ourselves during that time? How can we, what's the bare minimum we need to get, get to in order for this business to at least function. So when you're doing some budgeting and forecasting and working the numbers, yes, let's do the best case scenario sort of situation. But again, not to be a party pooper, I think it's also important to go, well, let's say there's going to be some unforeseen factors that I can't predict right now that's going to slow us from getting there. What could the business potentially look like with smaller revenue and smaller expenses, knowing that, okay, even if it doesn't go to plan, we can make some stuff work. There's still enough here to make it work that we can sustain ourselves long enough to get to that point we want to be. Yeah, absolutely. And if you get there faster, well, that's something to celebrate. And guess what? You didn't suck up as much of the capital as you thought you would. And life exactly. is good anyway. So it's a kind of a, it's a kind of a win-win. It's a lot worse on the other side where you're suddenly going, oh, month three, um, my projections didn't come in and now I'm hemorrhaging money and I need to find some more, um, a, an influx of capital, which is obviously never that easy a thing. Um, Not so, in today's world, uh, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so before we finish up, um, what are, what's one last piece of advice you would give to somebody with an online business, so a, a mistake that they can avoid? So this is one that I, I, I like to mention, and it's not specifically just to finance, but I think a lot of the times, um, especially depending on where you're at in your, your business, and, and, and there's so many people that listen to these podcasts who maybe are in the process of starting their business mm -hmm. or hoping to start their businesses that, um, you know, I'm so fortunate to get to work with, uh, like just some of the best in the online space, like in the coaching, course world, again, all, all the types of businesses we serve. And this does, this is not to take anything away from our clients and how amazing they are. But I think sometimes we think some of these other businesses, they know something we don't, or there's spe right. there's something special about them. And the reality is, is like so many of the clients we work, they're just people figuring it out. Just like all of us are, even although they might be in a different place in their businesses, 
and they might have to be yeah. figuring out new things. No one's like, cool, I got my plan and I know exactly what's going to happen and everyone else is floundering and I got this all figured out. That I just want to make sure as someone who, who gets to see behind the scenes of more businesses than almost anyone I know, um, especially the nitty gritty details, their numbers, like the most vulnerable parts mm -hmm. of their businesses, is that you know everyone has strengths and weaknesses. Everyone's trying to figure this out as they go along. Everyone deals with a little bit of imposter syndrome. What's important yeah. is that you're able to deal with, you're able to stay focused on your plan and, and stay focused on your results and just know that the people that don't make it are the ones that just kind of quit and think that there's something they're missing. And the reality is yeah. our clients, they're not, they're not like magical special people who were born with some gift. They just went out and did it and learned, made mistakes, learned from them quickly and just kept going. And stuck with it. Yeah. And, and I love the fact that you brought up the imposter syndrome, because I do think that that's a, a really critical thing for anybody who is, you know, considering starting your own business. Um, you will go through that, that you will go through that process of suddenly questioning your experience, questioning your talent, saying, oh, yeah, I want to do this, but you know, am I really that good? I mean, are people really going to pay me to do this? I'm not mm -hmm. sure. And that's when you have to just look look back at your experience that you've had and, and really examine it and realize that you probably have a lot more to offer than you think. And I agree with you. I think the people who have built fantastic businesses, um, a lot of it has to do with perseverance and just trusting their their trusting the talents that they have and overcoming that imposter syndrome, but certainly perseverance is, is critical. If you, if you stay focused on getting results for your clients or customers, and you're doing everything in your power to get those results for them, your business is gonna work. Like at the end of the day, if we're providing value and we're getting results, it's when we get a little too caught up in just the numbers, when we get just caught up in, in offerings and products that sound good to us, but are, are mm -hmm. missing the, the mark for like, are we actually solving a problem? Yeah. And that's what I've seen, like, it, it, you know, as much as, let's say, um, you know, I'm trying to tell everyone you don't need to have some special magical talent to be successful in business. The one thing all of our clients are really good at is solving a problem for their customers and delivering on that promise. So if you can do that and, and you yeah. trust in your ability to get results for your customers, then go get it done. Yeah, lovely. Perfect, perfect way to end. Um, thanks a lot, Parker. All of Parker's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and Evolved Finance. Sure. Yeah. If you're um, interested in what we do at Evolved Finance, just go to evolvefinance.com. That's kind of our central place for uh, anything you might want to, to know about us. I do a podcast with just myself where I talk a lot about um, what we're seeing in the online space, some of the financial concepts that um, we're trying to educate uh, business owners all across the country about. So, um, And then if you think you're a good fit for our service, let's set up a call and, and talk, see if we can help. Yeah, great. And, and I would recommend, as, as, uh, as we were talking about, I would highly recommend that you check out services like this because starting your own business, running your own business, it's tough enough without, uh, without trying to take on everything. And certainly uh, some of the financial side of things, if you take that off your shoulders and have a, you know, trust somebody to, to be your advisor, I think that's a, that's a very smart early investment to make. I might be biased, but I agree with that very much. <laughs> yeah, I thought you might. <laughs> Um, but it's actually, I 100% believe in that. All right. Uh, my name is John Golden. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you again for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.